Again, and welcome to Forum for a Better Understanding in its 165th weekly edition. We are so privileged today to have a conversation with an Islamic scholar and international speaker. Though we've had many programs with local Islamic leaders from the three different main centers here in town, from the Islamic Cultural Center on Knees, from the uh, Majid Fresno, and also from the Majid Al Aqaba, but today, Coming to us very recently from India, we have a scholar, Yusuf Estes. Sheikh Estes is a convert to uh, Islam. From what I hear, at age 47, he had a tremendous awakening of his faith. Being that he was a Christian preacher and musician and owner of a music empire, somehow, he's going to explain how, God spoke to him in a special way and he became Islamic. The conversation this week will begin today and we'll be with you at the same time next week with part two of this conversation which I've entitled The Truth of Islam. I was at the uh, Majid Fresno the night before we had this taping and it was wonderful to meet the Sheikh and to see a whole mosque of people, young, old and in between, men and women, sharing an interest in what he was sharing with them he has, I think, hundreds of websites, and we're going to be talking about some of the main ones later. But I think we should let Sheikh Yusuf Estes introduce himself a little bit more and why it is that he's in Fresno and why it is we're having our program today. Thank you, Sheikh, for being here with us. Jim, it's a pleasure to be with you, and it's a, b a real big honor and uh, for me to have a chance to be here with you guys and also for the folks there at home. I wanted to um, mention that you probably gave the closest to the reality of an introduction that I've heard about me in a long time. Nice. Because as you become more and more known around the world, it, people have a tendency to get further and further away from the real, the real deal. I've heard myself introduced to the extent that when I'm sitting backstage listening to this introduction going on, and I'm thinking, who is coming out? And they say, here he is, he's who is. I go, that wasn't me. But you said you got the age right, you got the background right, everything. The only thing I will take exception to the empire. <laughs> oh, yes. This is, uh, I want to play that down a little bit. We will play. He's not an uh, emperor. But the idea that you are very, very uh, available. I was called a benign be dictator once. <laughs> but at least benign. Benign. <laughs> now, where we, where we want to go in our conversation today and next week is for you to give a primer Mm. To, I, I think our viewing audience is mainly non-Muslim. So why don't we begin with this topic of Islam in life and society and let me throw out some words to you okay. and let you either do an etymology of it, a bit of an anecdotal comment, a bit of a reflection, whatever you'd like to open up the concept. Allah, the main thing we need to learn from the Islamic community. Tell us about Allah. Can I ask you a question? I like to play both ways. Okay? Oh, thank you. you know, we have our show too, so you know, uh, because I don't have a chance to get you to Texas to do our show, so I'm gonna kind of, we'll flip it back and forth. Fair? Fair enough. Cool. Now, may I ask you a question? Do you know any Arabic? Very, very little. Okay. A few words. Five words. Okay. So, what uh, the word for in the word Elah from Arabic Elah? is the equivalent of the English word God. Elah. Or El in Hebrew. El. Yep. You're familiar with that? El. Okay, God. so, yeah. yeah, that's God. So, if we have a word, Elah, and it means God, now I'm going to ask you, we have a word, Allah, what do you have to equal it? And you can look through the bag of tricks and you're never going to find it. I went to a lecture and I heard from the presenter that there is no word. The problem is in English. 
we have no word in English. Well, who uh, said that? That would be um, Sheikh Yusuf Estes. Uh, I heard him in a in a talk. Last night, actually. Where did you guys get this guy? <laughs> <laughs> so the big problem is in English. We yeah, don't have we, the word. For Jews and Christians and Muslims, all of us are suffering from a deficiency in the English language because it does not appropriately present what was said in the manuscripts. If you go back to the Hebrew and try to bring it to English, you've always got a problem. If you go back to Aramaic, you've got a problem. If you go back even to Kone Greek, you've got problems because these languages are rich and, and they, they bear fruit when you speak and the poetry is so excellent. And when you bring it to English, to a word that was actually Rud. It was Rud. That was what it was. That's how they pronounced it. And that just had to do for everything. So, actually... God is something worshipped, a deity which could be a rock, a stick, a stone, a bone. That could be worked into poetry, by the way. We'll think about that. Anyway, so you got this for deity, deity, deity. All right. But when you say Allah, that's his name. And it's unique in that it can't be made plural, nor can it have gender. Now, this is cool because, for especially for the women who say, how come the Bible is written from a man's point of view? Well, it's not really. The Bible wasn't written from a man's point of view. When God sent revelation in the Bible, what he was sending down was from himself. But he even says he himself about himself because he doesn't call himself it. No. But God's not having, uh, you know, a, 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 a male characteristics. Let's leave it at that. Nor exactly. female. No. No. He's way beyond that, above that. And so when we get that in our mind, then the other thing you might say, well, we find in Hebrew and we find also in Arabic, in the Quran and in the uh, Torah, this reference to we and our and us. Right. But this is the royal plural like the king or the queen uses. So it's not really God saying me and my army or me and my buddies, I'm going to have a, you know, some kind of a director's meeting tonight with my guys or, you know, it's not like that. So Allah is the name of God. And it's also the name used by Jews and Christians who are Arabs. Yep. That's all it is. Following on that, what, how would you summarize for us a Muslim's relationship with God? Sometimes we think it's very important to know in a faith, do they uh, find God judge? Do they find God merciful? Do they find God advocate? Do they find God a defender? What is the relationship mostly that Muslims feel for their God. Let me throw something at you and see how it sets. If somebody recognizes there is really a deity, a God, and even if they're not sure who is he and what is he and so on, but they recognize there's some, all this didn't come about by any accident. Therefore, there must be a God. There's a creator, a sustainer. Somebody's taking care of me. I have a thought. I need something. And then somehow it just pops up. Now, how can that keep happening? You know. So there's something out there. And what should be my relation? My relation should be what? And if they determine that they want to surrender themselves over to the Lord, and they want to submit to any commandment or authority, submit to the authority of the one above, and they want to obey any uh, injunctions that he might offer, and they want to do this sincerely and in peace, does that sound good? That does. It sounds like Islam. Well, that's what the word means. All of that in that one word. I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> and this is what the relationship of an Islamic believer is a total submission, to a him. total commitment, a total resignation of self to this greater, and doing it, as you say, in sincerity and sa'alam, in peace. All that's, of that is... The, the, the peace that we're talking about, a lot of times I hear Muslims say Islam is peace, and that's not really right. That's wrong to say that because... Uh, it doesn't mean the kind of peace like that we'd like to see peace in the Middle East, yeah, peace between brothers and so But this is a kind of peace that you have in your life that no matter what is sent to you from him, you're in peace. Now, there's two extremes here. Suppose somebody has all of the material things that come at them very fast, uh, like winning the lottery or something like this, and then said, oh my God, I can go crazy, right? So that's not peace. So if I was given these great riches and wealth of this world, but to be in peace and say, this too shall pass. Yeah. This isn't going to be forever. Then the other side of it, that when these calamities and disasters come to a person, but they're in peace with it, and they say, this too shall pass. Yeah. That's yeah. The, the middle road that we're looking for. Yeah. 
Now, whoever does this would be called an Islam-er, because that'd be the verb. Yeah. Yeah, Islam -er. or Aslama, and then he's an Islamer. Well, we don't use suffixes in Arabic language. We use prefixes for the verb. So instead of er, like walk, er, talk, er, think, er, stink, er, uh, like that. I'm sorry. Anyway, they use the prefix mu. So it would be mu adhan, the one who calls the prayer, mu safar, the one who travels, and mu islam, muslim. Wow, that's where we get Muslim. Yeah, yeah but say Muslim. Muslim. Yeah, don't say Muslim. You know no. why? Those are the detractors that's right. of Islam that call Muslims. them Muslim because it actually means wrongdoer. Muslim. Muslim. We used to see it printed Muslim on purpose. Now it's we see it much more Muslim. Mu Interesting. Slim. And mu. It, say mu. Uh, mu. Slim. Slim. Yeah, Muslim. like a slim cow. Mu. mu slim. Mu. Slim. Speaking of the next thing on our, on our topics, we're on to topic three of 50, so we have to go fast. This book, the Quran, could you introduce us to what the Quran is for those that of us who only know the Bible? Tell us about the Quran. Well, when you hold it like that and say Quran, it's not really oxymoron, but it doesn't really make sense. I'm going to tell you why. Because what you have in your hand is a kitab. That's a book. Okay? It's not Quran. You can't hold Quran in your hand. Why? Quran means that which is being recited. Recited, reciting. Yes. So it's like holding up a hymnal and saying, this is music. No, it's not. It represents music when you put it down and start playing it. But as long as you're holding your hand, it's just a book of paper. As soon as you start singing the song, it becomes music. But when I was in the music business, we'd say, where's your sheet music? It's yeah. over there. It's not really sheet music, a sheet of music. That's funny. If, see, do you catch that? But yeah. we've used it so long, nobody could ever separate the word sheet and music and say anything other than, yeah, it's this. Yeah. But in fact, that's the same problem we have when people say this is Quran, and it's not. Because Quran says in it that Allah will preserve it, and nobody can even touch it. It says right in it, nobody yeah. can even touch it except the pure, which are the angels. And you say, well, you just touched it, and I just touched it. I'm no angel. So how did that happen? Well, because this is not really the Qur'an itself. It represents something that's with the law. It's his speech. Qur'an means God's recitation. He recited it. The angel Gabriel heard it, and then he passed it to the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, just as he did with Moses and Abraham and Jesus, peace be upon all of them, before. Revelation came to them by way of this angel, Jibril or Gabriel. And then what they heard, they recited, their companions recited it and passed it down. On the other hand, people who want to say, I read in the Quran, or mm -hmm. it says in the Quran, does any of that have any uh, pertinence, that there are texts in the Quran? So maybe my question would be, given that the Quran is the recitation of God's word to us, um, how is it, what is in the, what is in this, recitation of this this gift from Gabriel. I feel like I'm giving you a hard time. <laughs> no, this is this is great for our audience to appreciate. I didn't mean to get too far off because you're right in what you're saying. Wait, I, I just was trying to make it small. No, this is good. Almost trivia. I'm sorry. Because actually you, you are exactly right in what you're saying. I say it all the time. I read it in the Quran this or I heard this and that. But for sure one thing that nobody should say is that I read in the Quran God said that he is one. For instance, why? Because he, that would be English words. Right. And the Quran is only Quran in Arabic. It has to be in Arabic to be Quran. When you translate it, you're not having Quran anymore. What you have is an opinion of somebody who heard something and tried to tell you what it meant. Not God's words anymore. Now, we are sometimes thinking in, in, in serious scholarship, you must go to the original text, be it Hebrew or, or Greek. You said sometimes? Meaning, a lot of people are still very comfortable with their translations, but in the Muslims Islamic world, not. they are not comfortable. Not comfortable, with, not accepted totally and completely unacceptable, even if you gave meaning of it in Arabic. I think we have a call from someone on, on a message about this show. Let's see if um, they wanted to ask us something. You know, they're asking, if that is so, why is it that not all Muslims are perhaps learning Arabic? which I've heard that that is an issue in the Islamic world, the importance of, uh, this is what the person asked, why is it then that people are not speaking? This is exactly what it says. 
Jim, why is it that sometimes people are not necessarily learning the original languages if it is so important in their faith, be they Catholic, Jewish, or Islamic? That's better. What do you? How would you answer First that? First of all, I'm going to tell you, your, your questioner, the one who called in, you're smart, and you asked a real good question, and I'm glad you gave us the whole question. I wish that Jews and Christians would take it as serious as Muslims do. Yeah. But even I'm going to say now about the Muslims, they also need to have more emphasis. But there is nobody on this earth of, as a group, as a, as a congregation, who is more concerned about the authenticity of language than the Muslims. Yeah. Be they Hindu, Buddhist, whatever. Because all Muslims know the Quran is only in Arabic, and every single Muslim knows some Arabic. And you can't say that about every single, not oh. every single Jew knows Hebrew. No. And not every single Christian oh. knows anything about the... No. Okay. So, here is something I can, you greeted me in Arabic. You said, Salaam Alaikum. Yes? That's yes. Arabic. And every Muslim knows that. One and a half billion Muslims know all of the first chapter of the Quran by heart. One and a half billion know the first chapter by heart in Arabic. And they know the last three or six or ten chapters all in Arabic. Wow. Well, that's, we're considering that not good enough. Yeah. This is our complaint. We're saying you don't have enough because, um, and some members of my family, I don't want to mention anybody because we don't like to praise people. But I, just to say, if somebody knows at least 20 or 30 chapters, we consider, okay, at least you're starting out right. Boy, but when you get up boy. to 50 to, let's say, 60 chapters, then we're going to go, all right, now you're getting there. Because that's about uh, half. There's 114. But when somebody comes to you and says they memorize the whole Quran in its entirety, word for word, letter for letter, then we'll say, okay, now let's have a serious discussion. Wow. Because you're not considered, not a scholar, listen to this, you're not considered worthy really to sit and discuss with scholars on their level until you have memorized the Quran in the Arabic language and have a command of the Arabia. Unbelievable. Now, I have one of my own relatives who's going to school to study this. He is Arab. He married into our family, and he knows Arabic language. And his father got upset with him when he went to the university. He said, "Why are you studying Arabic? That's our language." But because this is so deep, the oh, classical yeah. Arabic, and so this is a subject you can go on and on. But the main thing is this: today we have about 20 million human beings walking on the earth that totally memorize the Quran in the Arabic language, and they're from every part of the world. Eighty percent of those 20 million are not Arabs. Why is that something? And by the way, we have the highest respect for the Bible. Oh, yeah, you We would. have the highest respect for previous revelation, even though you don't have the originals anymore. But we have the respect that we wish we would see from Jews for their Bible and for the Christians for their work. Because many of them dishonor and disrespect their work, not just by the fact they don't learn it in the original language, but the way they treat it. Do you know that no Muslim will take the Quran into the bathroom? No. Nor will we take the Bible into the bathroom. We consider this whole, the bathroom. This is a dirty place. Why are you taking this in there? And so we wouldn't do that. Yeah. Muhammad. We, we haven't mentioned his name, and yet it's so he's so important to the tradition. Yes, and so then so. why don't we just put on top of that his hadith, uh, the things that okay. might be hadith falling. Hadith means stories. Hadith, sayings, teachings, uh, 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 narratives that come to us Let's talk about the, what is a hadith first. Because we now see that the Quran came to us by oral recitation, passed down in the memories of human beings, generation upon generation, with no change, even to one letter. It's interesting, if you look in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 17, 18, 19, it says, Think not that I came to change the law and the prophets, I came not to destroy, but to fulfill, not to all things are accomplished, shall a single letter, dot, jot, or iota be in any wise lessened. And this is a reference to God's Word itself. Yep. That the commandments are not going to change. And if you read the Quran carefully in the Arabic, you'll find that this is exactly what was called to before. First and foremost, there's no gods beside God. Honoring His name and honoring His worship, etc. And then the very next commandment after that is you honor your mother and your father, your parents. And then you shall not kill. And that's the same order that comes in Exodus. It's the same order that comes in Deuteronomy. It's the same order that comes in the Quran. And you'd be surprised and you think, well, I didn't know all of that. The problem with a lot of the Muslims today is that they don't know the real Muhammad. 
the Muslims who are out on the street corner say, I heard it the other night, I'm not going to tell you where, but I wanted to go close down the place myself, and they were the ones that brought me to speak. They got the kids up there to give it kid night, and they got, these kids are up there, and they're chanting and doing their, what do you call it, rap, something oh, like yeah, this, like dancing music, around their yeah, stuff, sure. and they were saying, death before dishonor, death before, I said, guys, hello, that's the opposite of what Muhammad taught, peace be upon him, the opposite. He never, ever upheld his honor over anything. People insulted him. They threw rocks on him. They spit on him. And he never said anything back to them except that there's only one God. Worship God. Don't worship what he created. Please, my brothers, please wow. listen to me. And they did horrible things. They beat him and they beat his friends. And he wouldn't let them fight back. He said, it's not about us. It's about this message. To the extent when they were engaged in a war, in later years, they were allowed to fight back and defend themselves. And in one of the wars, it was his cousin, Ali, who was fighting against one of the enemies. And then the sword of the enemy broke. The enemy had nothing to fight with, so he spit. He spit right in his face. And so Ali didn't kill him. He stopped. And he said, well, are you going to kill me? He said, no, if I would have killed you before, it would be for Allah. But now it would be personal and we're not allowed to do that. Do you see, we don't say that kind of thing. So when you see these guys going out with these bandanas on and their picket lines and all the things that they're doing, this is not Islam. This is the opposite of Islam. One thing that happened that was pivotal in the early form formative time of Islam would have been the, the uh, pilgrimage from Mecca to Medina, the Hashira. Can you tell us something Hijra. about... Tell us a little bit about that and, and how important that is and what, what caused it to be and the aftermath uh, of Muhammad bringing Islam to Medina. Well, first of all, uh, it wasn't early. It was uh, about in the 13th year of prophethood. And what happened here was an amazing thing. Again, what I was just saying, you, you knew when to bring that up. <laughs> because he, he and his followers had been so oppressed that their first hijra or leaving actually wasn't to this one. It was much earlier than that, and that's when they went to Ethiopia, uh, uh, Abyssinia. When they went to Abyssinia, which is what it was called then, they found refuge there with who? The Christians. Yeah. The Christian king there was so impressed with these people that he said that the difference between what we believe and what you believe is no more than this straw. Wow. And he later became a believer, and when he died, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, prayed for him in abstentia while he was down in another part of Arabia. He heard that his friend, this king, had died. They, I don't even know that they ever met. But he, wow. but he had such high regard for him that he actually prayed the funeral prayer for him, which is a very, uh, only reserved for Muslims. But uh, this shows you that the, how it's so important that we today understand that Christians and Muslims have a responsibility to come together and do what you're doing here. And by the way, if I didn't tell you before, I, I love you for what you're doing. Well, this is important. The people, their audience, they're important, and they need to know that what you and I are doing right here should be the beginning yeah. of something that really grows and encourages. Because now let's come back to the Hijra. The Hijra Medina was not the first, but it was a very important one because they had been boycotted and kicked out of their own land, out of their homes and everything, because they weren't allowed to fight back. So uh, they were put into this valley for over two years and nobody was allowed to trade with them, nobody was allowed to do business with them, nothing, and let them starve to death. So only passing caravans who might pass by or do anything who could do anything to help them and they, uh, some of them died, his wife died, his uncle died. It was really hard on all of them. But then some of the, the tribal members who took pity on them and said, guys, this isn't right, let's give them a chance. And one of the main opponents to Muhammad was his own uh, uncle and his cousin. And these two, they would have done anything to kill him, but they couldn't because of tribal law. Wow. And so he wanted to get his people away, and they went to a place called Yathrib. And Yathrib was the name of the city, and the word for city in Arabic is Medina. So many people were talking about the city, the city, the city. Yeah. It became nicknamed the city. Wow. Like we say the Windy City when we're talking about it. And San Francisco Chicago. we call the city. Yeah, yeah it, in it's... San Francisco it's called the city. Are you going to the city? So that's how Medina got its name. Wow. Anyway, so 
what that was all about was a, a, an agreement that was reached with the people of Medina that said the tribes there would protect him and his followers if they would go there. Because he, they needed to be protected from their own relatives. Because they were pagan idol worshippers who were really, really bad. These people had some habits that I can't even tell you on TV. They're so bad. But I'll tell you something. One of them was that it was disgusting to them to see a girl born into the family, especially oh. like they want boys, you know. Yeah. So they would take this newborn baby girl to the desert and bury her alive. Oh, my. Women had no rights. They weren't allowed to speak. They weren't allowed to own property. They weren't allowed to inherit. A man could say, okay, this little orphan girl has got money, and I marry her, and she's only three, three years old or two years old. He could say, I married that girl. Nobody could stop him. So there was no rights for women whatsoever. Zero. So when these guys are coming along talking about women's rights, they're talking about... This was unheard of 1,400 years ago. At the same time, by the way, the Catholic Church was holding counsel to decide if a woman even had a soul. That's it. This is amazing that we sometimes wonder with this topic of um, women in Islam, which we may cover next week a little bit more, but let's say we touched it a little today. We sometimes think, oh... When is the Islamic world going to, you know, move on and understand the rights of women? Uh, this pamphlet is one of those that's going to remind us, as Yusuf Estes has just done, back in its roots, Islam was a very liberating force, was a very, very um, open-minded approach, way more advanced than the culture that it absorbed. We have about three minutes left in our um, first Where program. Where does the time go it, when you're having fun? It just goes, but luckily... <laughs> We will be back next week. But let's say, if I throw two words out right now and see if we can close our first program on this. What about the caliphs? That became, I think, a very important governing force. But before we do that, we want to mention the website. I'm getting a signal that we want to remind people to find out so much of what we're talking about today. You can go to shareislam.com. It's one of the hundreds of websites that are available out there. Thousands, but who's counting? Thousands that Yusuf Estes is, is involved in, but the one that he says, oh, the best one I'd send you to, shareislam.com. You will find all these topics we're talking about today uh, developed and, and expanded. Khalifas. What about the Khalifas? Well, first of all, after the death of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the only way they could continue was to have one central government of leadership. And the first one to take over was the very first Muslim who actually accepted the belief that there's only one God, Muhammad's his messenger, which was Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr only lived about two and a half years after that, and then he passed wow. away. On his deathbed, he wanted Omar to accede after him, and he did. And uh, Omar was about 13, 15 years, something like that, and then he was assassinated oh in the morning prayer. And as he was dying, he had a lot of influence on getting uh, Uthman, and they basically charged it. Uh, Uthman with that task. He then uh, was about, uh, I think, was it 10, 11, 12 years, and uh, then he was also assassinated. Uh, yeah. And then that, Ali... Deaths at the beginning of Islam. Yeah. Uh, and, and what's bad is the division of the Muslims themselves and how they were all fighting for this power all of a sudden. What we're going to say, unfortunately, Yusuf, is that we'll be back next week and pick up right where we left off. We have been opening up to you the truth about Islam. And next week at the same time with my same guest, Sheikh Yusuf Estes, we will be able to share with you deeper and more important concepts than even we brought up today. Stay tuned for another program on Channel 49 and join us next week for part two of our conversation. God bless. بسم الله Hello again and welcome to the 165th consecutive program called Forum for a Better Understanding here at Channel 49. When we started this program four years ago, it usually consists in three guests who are sharing around a very important topic, the three guests representing different religious traditions. But today we have really struck the lottery and we wind up having one guest who is able to represent 
as a convert from Christianity to Islam, an ability to handle in his own faith so many traditions that he already grew up with and that he has grown into. We have this guest who is Sheikh Yusuf Estes, who has recently been in India, who is a world traveler, an Islamic scholar and international speaker, the person that is able to be reached on thousands of websites, of which I think I'll mention one of them right now because it's such an easy way for us to get in touch with the Sheikh, shareislam.com. How easy is that? Shareislam.com. That could be the tip of the iceberg for you to get into this wonderful Islamic scholar whom we met last week, but I think today he should reintroduce himself, say a few things about himself, and pick up where we left off last week with this division that started early on. Now, in Christianity, believe it or not, there were many, many divisions at its roots. There have been many, many schisms. There have been many, many divisions. So it's not unique to Islam that it is froth with divisions in its, in its birth. Sheikh, great to have you back. It's great to be here, Jim. Tell us about a little bit about yourself, maybe things you didn't say last week about your, your coming to Islam. Well, yes, when I first was uh, introduced to the subject of Islam, I was not interested in a new religion. In fact, I was very happy with what I had, and I was trying to convert a Muslim to become a Christian. Because you were a pastor. Well, I was a preacher. There's a difference. Okay, you're a preacher. Pastor is uh, as much, I think, more dignified than me. I was just a person out preaching the word, you know? Very and a musician. Very much a musician. And this is your life. Putting it all together, trying to call people to the Lord, etc. Along the way, the man said something to me that struck me really hard. Because he realized that I was proselytizing from day one. Three months into it, we were working together. And he knows I'm trying to convert him. He could see in every discussion, every argument, that all I'm trying to do is do what? Just convert him. Well, he told me at one point, he said, you know, I'll go to your faith. I'll be a Christian if your religion's better than my religion. And I said, whoa, wait a minute. This I've got him. I've got him where I want him. i got the fish on the hook. Because, as we're going to do, cover in this program, there are a lot of things you have to do to be a Muslim. A lot. We'll talk about it. But one thing was, I said, from what I'd heard from him and seen him five times a day doing his rituals, I said, you don't have to do that in Christianity. You don't have to fast an entire month. You don't have to give something called zakat to the poor. You don't have to. It's nice if you do. And you don't have to go halfway around the world to go to a box in the desert and do all these rituals. You don't have to do that. And uh, you don't even have to be nice. It's better if you do. But you just want to be a Christian. It's pretty simple. You know, really, it's yeah. what you say. Yeah. But then he finished the sentence. He said, I'll go to your faith. if It's better than my faith. But you'll need proof. And I said, man, religion has never been about no. proof. It's about faith. That's it. That's what religion is. He said, in Islam, we have both. We have proof and faith. And listen to this. I said, you mean to sit there and tell me as a Muslim that you can prove there really is a God? And he said, do you mean to sit there and tell me as a preacher of Christianity that you can't? Now, this person that you're in this dialogue with, you really had aspirations that he would come to you. You thought you had him. But he was really very <laughs> versed in his own faith. He was not uh, a wobbler. He no. was a waffler. <laughs> no. How had so when he proposes this, when he poses to you the idea of he can prove by faith and also by, by hard evidence. I'm evidence. asking him for testable. You didn't find that you had that in Christianity. It, what is the testable evidence that there's God? And he said, and we're not going to rely on the scripture of the Quran, nor on what is something from Muhammad. We're not going to do that. Wow. And he said, and you can bring your Bible, too. And Boy, I'm this going, is an Whoa. interesting conversation. Wow. Whoa, I was, I'm like, I got to do this. The things that he said and showed me and taught me helped me to better understand my own religion to the extent that I was so happy now that I knew what a Christian was. And now I really got into Christianity heavy. For the next few weeks, I was really reading, studying, and praying, and doing so many things because I was happy because there's proof there's God. There's proof that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, it really is a miracle birth. There's proof from uh, real evidence that here that Jesus is actually going to come back in the last days. And I'm thinking, good Lord, man, I never felt so happy in all my life. And then I, after a while, though, I came to this 
realization that, wait a minute, but all this proof is coming from the Muslims. And then I start realizing that, wait a minute, you so you guys are really believing what I've always grown up believing, but you have evidence. And if you've got evidence, then why am I still over here? Why am I over there finding out more about what you have? I don't believe in The thing that happens that's so important for every human being is to come to the conclusion that you're not God. And you're not the one to tell him what the religion is. A priest, a bishop, a pope, a minister, a pastor, they don't have the right to redefine God's religion and come up with something new and say, guys, today we're going to do this. Tomorrow we'll do that. The next day, so and so. If it didn't come from God originally, that would be a man-made religion. And this is what atheists and agnostics are always harping on this yeah. subject. Oh, yeah. man-made religion, man-made religion. I just love God. That's good enough for me. But they don't know that there is a God-made religion. And it's called submission to God in peace. Do his commandments. And for a person who doesn't want to believe, and it's usually because they don't want to do what goes next, to say, I believe in God is one subject. But as soon as you say it, then if you're really a believer in the monotheistic faith, Judaism, Christianity, or Islam, you're going to be bound to those commandments. Because Jesus said himself that he doesn't come to destroy any previous scripture or law or any of the prophets, but rather to fulfill. And so if you understood that, all of these... All of these things are still in place. Nobody has any authority. In fact, look at this. That whoever breaks the least commandment and teaches this, meaning teaching that it's okay to break it, then he's going to be the least in the kingdom. But whoever keeps the commandments and teaches this, he's going to be the highest in the kingdom. And unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, who were the biggest hypocrites, the biggest... Uh, road hogs of ta in the town taking over the church and running to search, uh, suit themselves, which was the temple, you know. Uh, remember, he drove them out with a whip, the money changers. He was very serious against yeah. what they had done. Yeah. So he's saying this, and, and then you come in and you look at Islam. What is Islam saying? It's essentially the same thing. That we, ha if you have some guy wearing a big turban and out here and he's saying this and saying that, hold on a second. Is that really what God said? Because if I can't find that evidence from the Quran and the teachings of Muhammad, then who is this guy? He's not God. Yeah. And that's a problem we have today. Too many people listening to the wrong people. We could do two things right now. And I think what we're going to do is move along to the point of the five pillars. Because if there's one thing we want to have time for, it's for you to develop for us the heart of Islam. Sure. And there are basically, as I understand it, five deep, important concepts that if you could unpack each one of them the audience the viewers will be so happy the first one can you tell us about shahada this bearing witness what does that mean what does that concept I'm gonna tell include? you a story I'm from Texas we tell stories oh you're from I didn't notice yeah you didn't notice how I did. yeah I'm from Texas maybe you won't see the gun anyhow <laughs> but listen to this this is a story that actually happened to Muhammad peace be upon him he asked his companions to ask me some questions, but they were too shy because they know he's the prophet of God and they were shy in front of him, you know, much the same as the companions of Jesus would have been. Oh, yeah. And he's saying, ask me, and they're going, no, that's okay, that's okay. we're shy. And we're... So suddenly a man appeared and they, who's this guy? And his clothes were exceedingly white, his hair exceedingly black. The expression meant that he didn't have signs of travel on him. They didn't know who he was, yet he wasn't a traveler. Who is this guy? And he came right up in front of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, kneeled down in front of him, put his knees to his knees, put his hands on his thighs, looked him in the eye, and he said, What is Islam? And he answered, and he said, It is the Shahada, the Salah, the Zakah, the Salm, and the Hajj. And I said all that in Arabic, and then we're going to break that down. That's the five pillars. And then he said to him, You spoke the truth. Now the companions are shocked. Who, who, the nerve, the unmitigated gall of this guy to say, ask a question and then confirm, who is this? Later, uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said, go get this man and bring him back. They came back and said, we can't find him. He said, I know. That was the angel Gabriel. I knew he it. came to teach you your religion. Now, two things. We mentioned Gabriel last week. We mentioned Gabriel today. We know in our scripture, Gabriel is the announcer to the Virgin Mary about the birth of Jesus. It's a character, a figure, that winds up playing in, obviously, the scriptures, the Christian scriptures, and in the uh, 
in the Quran. Same story in the Quran too, by the way. In the scriptures that you have, you have the Gabriel, the angel announcing to Mary about the virgin birth, and she's kind of taken aback by that, as any woman would have been, of course. We have the same story in the Quran, chapter 19. If you get a Quran, chapter 19, called Shirtul Miriam. It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing. We actually have copies of this Quran. Of course, we talked last week that you really want to read it in Arabic. But if you're an English speaker exclusively, or even bilingual Spanish-English speaker, and you are not going to learn Arabic next week, we would make this available to you in translation. I have these at the office, actually, uh, some copies from Kamal. So if you would do me a favor, call us at 488-7440. We'll send you a copy, or you can come by and pick it up. And then you'd be able to look in the 19th chapter and find out not only is Mary given tremendous uh, presence in the Quran, but the prophet Jesus is given as much importance as you will be amazed, it's almost as much as what good Christians would give to Jesus in the scriptures. It's amazing the importance to the Islamic community, Jesus the Messiah, the virginally born, the resurrected, and the one who will be coming to um, be the Messiah at the end of time. It's, it's a very, very important message that we share with our Islamic community, and it's very important you could find it in the Quran. Getting back to the first principle of the Shahada, yeah, Tell us a little bit more about what, is what it means. Yeah, what shahada mean? is an Arabic word. It means to witness something. Somebody who like witnesses a traffic accident, he's uh, one of the people that saw it, so they might use that word there. Or somebody who witnesses a document being signed like a notary public, and he is uh, uh, a shaheed for this. He's uh, a witness to it. So in this way, uh, we understand it's a bearing witness. It's like saying open testimony in front of a court. I bear witness to what I'm about to say is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help me. So help me, God. And they took that last word out now. You know that. Anyhow, so this is, statement says in Arabic, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, la sharika la. Wa ashadu. On the Muhammadin Abduhu or so that's the elongated version of it. It means that I bear witness in open testimony that there is no deity, no God, none to worship except the one and only true God, Allah, and He has no partners. And I bear witness in open testimony that Muhammad is His last and His final slave, servant, and messenger of Almighty God. That's the statement. But it carries a meaning behind it that it's so much deeper than a few words. First of all, is the understanding that God is never like his creation, and he's not in his creation. He's not omnipresent, and it is not pantheism to say, you know, God is everywhere. The belief in Islam is that God is everywhere in his knowledge, his hearing, his sight, his mercy, his love, but he doesn't have a physical presence within his creation. He's out of the creation, above his throne, above his heavens. And he's in, in all majesty and all honor. And, and uh, this is, is some of the things. Now, the other thing that is understood right away is that the relationship has to be that I do what he wants me to do. And that's what Muhammad Rasulullah means. If you say that he's the messenger, it means you're going to follow him. If you said this is really the messenger and he's brought a message, then you're going to accept him as the messenger. You're going to do it. If he tells you, look, the king has ordered you to do this and that and the other, and you say, yeah, I'm not going to. But you just acknowledge he was the messenger. Why aren't you doing it? So it means that I will live up to what a true Muslim is. And one thing that we have in Christianity, this idea of witness, the Greek word for it is martyr. So obviously the whole idea of being willing to die for what it is Same we word. profess. What we believe, what we profess, must be put in action. Mm -hmm. Now one action that is the second pillar of Islam, Salat. Tell us about how important prayer is. The Salah is not just prayer. We spoke about this last week. The English language is okay. deficient, deficient, deficient. Because in... And, and you find it in the Bible when you're trying to understand oh, yeah. when, when it says in the Bible, pray unceasingly. How in the world yeah. can I pray unceasingly? I don't know how I could do that. How long can you talk? Yeah. Well, that I might be able to do. <laughs> but, <laughs> right. but when it comes to when it comes to the ritualistic worship where you're standing and bowing and so on, you can't do that. You started that. So in Arabic, they have three separate words that are very clear what you're talking about. And all of them deal with what we use in English, one word prayer. Because when you go like this, what are you doing? Praying. Praying. 
Well, we do it with our hands open because we're more beggars, you know, in front of God. Nice. We want to catch something if it's coming. Nice. So, but it's the same meaning. Yeah. And this thing is called dua. Dua. It means to call. Like when we call people to come to be. To call to uh, prayer? The, the, no, no. When we call somebody to come and listen to the message of God, we give him da'wa. Come on. I'm inviting you to come and listen to something. All right. So this is da'wa. This is one kind of prayer. But then there's a kind where you just unceasingly keep God in your consciousness. And it's not out loud necessarily. You no. can, but you'd be saying like, yep. praise God, praise God, praise sure. God. Which is, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. Allah Akbar, God is greatest, God is greatest. In your mind, you're thinking, I love God. Oh, he's so wonderful. I extol your greatness. Oh, Lord, I love you so much. And it's in the back of your mind, and this is called dhikr. It's a remembrance in the back of the mind and in the heart. And, and you know, it can get out loud too, but it's the unceasing prayer. That's it. So this solves the problem in Christianity. For me, I can say, yeah, I can do that. I can think about God. And then when I need something, or I want to thank, thank you for this, and now I want this, which is what we usually do. Then there is this, which you don't have in Christianity uh, anymore, except in a Catholic church. You still have this. Occasionally, you will see a priest or the Pope who will bow down and put his head on the ground. Oh, yeah. And then this is still maintained in Islam. Oh, yeah. Very, okay. very much. So the falling on the face that we find in the Bible, the bowing down to Almighty God, which is still is preserved. It, uh, it is still partially preserved in Catholic Church, but a lot of the other churches are totally away from that. They don't know about it. So uh, this ritual is called Salah. And this is something special that when a person goes like this, he's basically throwing the whole world away, knocking everything out of his way, and it's now direct communication, direct hookup between me and him. And nothing going to disturb him. He's going to go for the next three to five minutes to do his salah and putting his hands like this. And then he begins to recite from the Quran. And at a certain point, he will bend and bow, That's right. back up, and then his head on the ground, sitting and then back on the ground and come back up. And that is called a raqqa from this thing called rukua. A bending over, a bowing. So a full, complete one is called a rakka. And when a person does this in five times a day, he's considered in good standing with the Lord. And in each one of these times, he has a chance to be forgiven, to remember about God. And then real important after each one is to ask God, Oh God, forgive me. And then ask for whatever you need. And all of this is something he's doing five times a day. Now, ask yourself a question. How could a guy do all this five times a day and be a bad person? Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, asks, if a man has a river flowing by his house and he bathes in it five times a day, is there any dirt on his body? And they, he said, and this is the same way as the Salah is for the believer. Really? But this is not in the case of somebody who doesn't do a Salah. He says he's Muslim, but he doesn't do a Salah. No, how are you? Well, this is prescribed five times a day. Now, one thing that's prescribed once a year, but for a whole month, is the fasting during Ramadan. Can you introduce us to this? Psalm. The word is Psalm, and it means to abstain from something. And actually, it refers to a much broader scope. And now, again, in Catholic, you have, you have the broader scope, because a lot of people don't know about this. Oh, yeah. But during Lent, there are different things that you can abstain from. You can give up smoking. You can give up lying, cheating, stealing, or any of the things that we shouldn't have been doing anyway. You can give up golf, although I don't want to push that too that hard in, in California. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's very fine to golf here. <laughs> What's your handicap? Never uh, I don't golf, but the bishop's a big golfer, so we, we support oh, golfing. Okay, that sounds good to me. But anyhow, so <laughs> you could give up many things. And in the Quran, it's mentioned about people who were fasting from speaking, not speaking for so many days and so on. And so this is abstaining, and what Muslims abstain from during the lunar month of Ramadan. Lunar month, just like for the Jews, moves backward through the sun calendar 11 days every year. So we have 354 days instead of 365.425. In other words, you have 365 and a quarter. But in the lunar calendar, you have 354. Okay. And so it moves backward in the calendar. This means that in the 33 and, a half, 33 and a third year period, you will have completely fasted every single day of the year. Oh so the short days, long days, and wow. so on. Yeah, it's All cool. calculated towards that. And then I think I saw a program on it where to find out when Ramadan will start is the crescent moon, exactly yep. the, the moment when it happens because it's an indefinite thing. It's a, it it's lasts a thing. It about it, uh, less than 15 minutes that you can actually, maybe even less than that, that you see it up there. It looks like a thumbnail, and then you can start. But now let's talk about what is it. It is to abstain from any intake 
okay, which is any food or liquid or anything at all during the daylight hours. But yeah. when the sun goes down, you're free to eat, drink, and party hardy marty. But, of course, not bad stuff. You would think. Yeah, because would be. you would think how counterproductive if somebody fasted and then for some reason... I don't want to go too deep into this, but I will tell you something that happened one time because I counsel with a lot of people, Americans, who were coming into Islam. And there were some of the street guys who were pretty bad in the streets, but they came to Islam trying to clean up their act. And one of them is brand new. And he goes to the guy after they're breaking their fast on the first day of Ramadan. And he goes to the guy and he said, I got something for you to break your fast with. And he handed him a marijuana cigarette. I could suppose. <laughs> This is probably not. I said, oh my God, what are you guys doing? Well, what do you this is crazy. This doesn't, this doesn't work. Well, anyway, to abstain from any kind of food or drink and also marital relations during the daylight hours. But then at night, you're free to eat, drink, and go to your wives or husbands. And so this is uh, the foundation here of that. But there's more. You must also have a God consciousness at this time. Being aware that other people don't have. In your fasting now, you get a little semblance of what it's like to be without food and drink for others. And you start becoming more compassionate. Also, you stay away from any kind of backbiting, any oh, kind yeah. of lying, any oh, yeah. kind of, of uh, gossip, and you just keep more quiet. And when you're fasting, it's easier to be quiet. Yeah. It's real easy to be quiet. You can be also a little bit edgy, though, yourselves with, with not eating well. You can be, I mean, I have found, you know, you're fasting or you're doing something dietary. You could be more, you know, prone to jump. So it's good that you have a, a discipline that allows. One thing I wanted to say about Islamic youth that I know in this valley, what's so interesting is that when they fast, which they do, it, it does complicate their lives a little because let's say they're on a sports team, which they are. They're volleyball players at Edison High. How important it is for them to know that though their body may not be having the energy from a big lunch that would have helped them get ready for the big competition, they were able to survive that. That month is a very important discipline for being able to change what you, your expectations are. I'll have a snack, I'll get an energy bar, I'll have a little caffeine. No, not during Ramadan. Jim, you hit the key word. The key word is discipline to develop discipline in your life and to learn how to set goals and achieve those goals. Hatim Olajuwon, who was a famous basketball oh, yes. player from Houston, Texas. I know him personally. And uh, he does his best in the month of fasting when he's out there and he hasn't had anything all day long. Then they're out there and he will not break his fast. He's going to go, yes. even he's traveling and doing all this. And Mamadou, who is with the Canadian, with uh, Toronto Rafters, the basketball team there, also big on following Islam the proper way. Good. And when any of these people in the sports, you see them out here are doing all these things and pushing their bodies, and there's no relief whatsoever. But boy, I'll tell you what, when they break their fast, I bet they're happy. Oh, I bet they uh, <laughs> enjoy a big, big meal. But to think that even professional athletes who would be usually dependent on carving up before, they can't. They don't. No. And then to say that he does well during that season. Yeah, it's some of the best well. games that they have. But uh, I'm not recommending for anybody to, to fast for that purpose. The reason we fast is because it's an order from our Lord, and we're doing it to get closer to him. Now, there's another thing that's associated immediately, this for the next point, called zakah. Yes. Zakah means to purify something. It's used in the Quran with other things about purification as well. But in this case, it's purification of the money or holdings that you have. And so during the month of Ramadan, it's, you're thinking about others anyway. So it's logical and it's what happens. Muslims will give their charity or zakat during this month. And you have an estimation of your wealth. And then you take how much you had for a whole year. Not what you have today, but what you held. Wow. You held it for a whole year. You didn't use it. Therefore, it's time to tax it. Two and a half percent, not ten. Just two and a half percent of what you've held. What you held, you obviously didn't need it because you had it a whole year sitting in a closet or whatever. Then that is to be distributed immediately to the poor. Now, not to the mosque. It doesn't have to go to the mosque. In fact, the mosque cannot use that except to distribute to the things that are qualified to receive this purification. So you can actually give it yourself. It's between you and God anyway. You can just give it. And here's a poor family here. Usually your own family, if you have, you start there. Do we have any poor in our family? Or the outer family? Or the extended family? Or our society close by? But it even goes to those who are not Muslim. Yep. And it goes to those who are in need. And you're not doing it because you're such a, a great benefactor or a great generous person. But you're doing it to purify yourself. 
I need to do this to purify me. So you give it and you say to them, thank you. Thank you for taking it. Now that's the cause. Then there's a lot about it, but we'll move to the next one. The next one is the one which uh, I had a lot of trepidation about this when I got into Islam. This thing about Hajj. Hajj is to make this pilgrimage to the holy place in Mecca. And there's a, I used to call it the black box in the desert when I wasn't, uh, I wasn't a Muslim. <laughs> it was kind of attacking Islam when I said that. But when I got there and saw everything goes with it, I cried. In fact, when I saw the Kaaba itself, it's a huge, this, this black drapery that you have here is similar to the black drapery that's there. And it's, uh, it's a little higher than this, though. But uh, you get the idea. And so there you are. And you're seeing this place which represents the place that Abraham came to so many centuries ago with his son and the two of them built this place up on the very foundation where it's believed that some believe that Adam actually prostrated there to ask forgiveness for eating the fruit. Wow. Yeah, it's a, the oldest place of worship on earth. And so here is now Muhammad, and he's coming to these people and telling them, let's get back to the original religion. Let's call ourselves back to the real deal, guys. And he's, because they know their history. But they had added so much false worship sure. along to what Abraham had, they couldn't recognize it anymore. But they have this thing about circumambulating around the Kaaba, and then this going between the two mounts and then going to Arafat, the plain of Arafat, and worshiping and praying. And it's about a three, four day thing that you're involved in. And when it's all over with, you come back as though you're a newborn babe, forgiven and starting all over. We have had people on this program who have come back from doing Hajj, some of them adults who have only been there first time they were able to ever have it happen for them. And I want to thank you for reminding us on the second program of the five pillars, we obviously didn't cover, believe it or not, all the things that we could have if we had had five shows. But in the two programs with Sheikh Yusuf <laughs> Estes, we did cover, I think, a good, good idea. One place to find more of these ideas is at the website called shareislam.com. Many of the things you would like to learn about Islam that you wish we had brought up, Sunni, Shia, Sufi, something about the differences among Islam, the things about uh, the groups in the world and why there's any differences, the things that are subtle problems that you think. You read the paper and you say, what's this about Al-Qaeda? All of the things that might be on your mind, you go to the website, share Islam, you may find out answers to all of these issues. I want to thank the Sheikh for being here today and I hope you'll be here next week with another program. God bless.